a wonderful place. Enjoyed every minute of it. We lived for a little while down in the uh, Bay of Plenty, a place called uh, uh, Taniatua, just outside of Taniatua. And uh, my dad was working there, as some of you will remember, for, among the Maori people. And then we moved to Hamilton, where we lived for seven years in Hamilton. Went through school there. Didn't quite finish high school there. We moved to Auckland then, when my dad was moved to the conference office for a little while as home mission secretary. And uh, when I finished at, uh, at the uh, Auckland Grammar School, they didn't have the, the church high school running right through all the high school subjects in those days, so we had to finish off in the state school. And I went to Longburn College where I had two years as a student and after the two years at Longburn we then went on to Australia and I've lived in Australia and America ever since. But we're glad to be back. We're retired now living in Mossvale, south of Sydney for the last uh, 12, 14 months and kept busy doing things from, for the general conference and for the church, the local church in the area. And my wife and I are happy to be here for camp. Lovely to meet with you. Uh, I guess many of you will remember my dad and my brother. He worked in North New Zealand for a while as well. My brother, Lynn. I think he was pastor at Odahu for a time, wasn't he? And somewhere else. I, I forget where, but that's fine. Well, now let's have a word of prayer before we start. I don't know if there's a special item listed for this meeting, but if there is, it can come at the end when you're all waiting for your lunch. <laughs> uh, let's have a word of prayer before we start. <clears throat> Our loving Father, we're very grateful this morning that we can come together and, and uh, spend time in the study of your word. We're grateful for the Bible and uh, for the messages it contains and for the fact that we have been enlightened by your Holy Spirit and other agencies to a knowledge of truth and a preparation for the coming of Jesus. We sincerely pray for your blessing today as we spend time in our study of your word uh, please uplift us, draw us closer to Jesus, and help us to have greater confidence in the family of God, the church. And so to this end, we dedicate ourselves this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Now before I start, um, it was my privilege, I suppose you'd call it a privilege, I don't know how to put it when, when it involves a funeral. You know, when a pastor performs a funeral, do you say it was a privilege to perform the, the funeral? Um, an honor, I suppose you could say, when the family of a deceased one invites you to, to conduct the funeral. And the funeral I conducted last Tuesday morning was that of uh, Pastor Veer Woodstoatsbury. Now, many of you would know him because he was president in this conference for a time, I believe. And uh, his family, Celia and uh, Dudley and uh, the other children, they asked me if I could um, conduct the funeral at Kurenbong, which I did. I didn't know him as well as some people, but um, we had some association together at different times. And he was a great old scout, wasn't he? A wonderful president, a, a man who loved the people and who dedicated his life in service for Christ and his church. And he died on... on uh, I think it was the previous Tuesday. We were in Perth when I got news of his death. My own wife's father had died, and we buried him the previous Tuesday in, uh, in West Australia. And then we flew back to Sydney and went straight to Kurenbong on the Tuesday for uh, uh, Elder or Pastor Veer Wood Stotesbury's funeral. And his family asked me to let you know about that and to express to you their, um, their interest in you knowing that uh, this good old warrior of, of the church is now resting peacefully. <coughs> On successive visits to England in the last uh, few years, my wife and I went in search of our heritage. You know what it's like. We wanted to know where family, where our families originated. And it was a rewarding search because we found the little village where my wife's mother was born. We found the house in which she was born. It's still there. 
Some of you would remember the Ashtons from Tauranga. And my wife's mother was Doris Ashton, you see. And uh, she was born there in this little village in uh, the uh, central part of England, perhaps the northern part, up near York. And during the search for my uh, heritage, we went to a little uh, town, the township of Dorking, which is just south of London a little, and we found there the property where the Phillips family came from, the property which they used to own. It was a large property in the earlier days, 600 acres. Uh, today, 350 of those acres are planted in vineyards. It's the largest wine-producing vineyard in England. Um, I don't think it belongs to any of the Philps anymore. I went there to stake my claim. <laughs> you know, I, I, I reckon that I should have a portion of that property, but they didn't uh, think the same as I did. Um, the, I made a contribution to their profits by eating in their restaurant and uh, took some photographs and, and all that sort of thing. And, and in February, when we get back to Sydney, we're having a, a gathering of the Philps clan at Kurenbong. They're coming from Adelaide, and even from America. My little sister's coming across, and we're going to gather together. You know, heritage is an interesting thing, isn't it? It sort of it gives you a warm feeling. I felt when we discovered the, the places where my wife's mother came from and where my mother came from, that I belonged in some way to these places. Uh, there's a warm feeling came over us. And, and you know what it's like, don't you? It, it's, um, a family is important to us. Ideally, uh, family represents a, a bonding. A, 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 there's a warmth that binds us together in the ideal family. And this is also true of God's family, the church. Uh, in Psalm 133 and verse 1, the scripture says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And so right here at the beginning of this series of Bible studies uh, that run right through till, till Friday, uh, I wish to take you with me uh, as we explore the heritage of our church. Uh, where did our church come from? What are the circumstances of its beginnings? What has been its experience down through the years? Uh, that's what I want to talk about in today's subject. You know, the idea of church began in the mind of God. The Greek word in the New Testament translated church comes from the Greek, uh, the Greek word is ecclesia which literally translated means called out ones. And when God wanted to establish an identifiable presence or representation of the heavenly family here on earth, he called out a, a group of people from Egyptian bondage and made them his first church. Many centuries later, as recorded in Acts chapter 7, verse 38, the Apostle Paul, uh, I'm sorry, not the Apostle, Apostle Stephen, at the time of, or just before his, his um, martyrdom, identified the church that existed back there in the Old Testament times as the church in the wilderness. He calls it that, the church in the wilderness. Because that's what Israel was. It was God's church back in the wilderness. In the times of Moses and those who followed, that was God's church. And from a study of the instruction that was given to that church, uh, it becomes clear that the first church was built on two foundational principles, important principles. One was the commandments of God, and the other was the faith of Jesus. Two simple but very important principles. Now, the commandments of God, of course, were emphasized in many passages in the Old Testament, and you are familiar with those. There's Exodus 19 and 20. You have the giving of the Ten Commandments, the God writing them on tables of stone, and, uh, and uh, calling upon his people to live in harmony and obedience to those. And also the church in the wilderness was given detailed instruction relating to the forgiveness of sins. Uh, in fact, the whole sacrifice system was established to illustrate to the Israelites that forgiveness could be received only by faith in a vicarious sacrifice. What is a vicarious sacrifice? It's a sacrifice in place of. In other words, they were being taught by the sacrifice system uh, and the death of the Lamb, uh, which foreshadowed the death of Jesus Christ, and their participation 
in the sacrifice system and the death of the lamb from time to time as they brought the, the lamb sacrifice demonstrated their faith in the coming redeemer, Jesus Christ. Now you know that as well as I do. I mean, it's, it's a simple fact of, of, of truth. And so you have the first church then, the church in the wilderness, being established upon these two foundational principles, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, or faith in, in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now that's the platform. Now down through the years, God richly blessed his church. And you find um, much reference to that. I mean, uh, he fed them bread from heaven. As they came out of e Egyptian bondage, he, he brought them water out of a rock. Uh, he guided them by, by night, by a pillar of fire, and by day, by a pillar of cloud. Uh, many rich blessings followed his people. In fact, in fact, if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, you find there that God made wonderful promises to his church. He said, if you will uh, obey my commandments and do those things which I've given unto you, then you shall be a, a above only and not beneath. You shall be the head and not the tail. He said, you'll be blessed in your coming in and your going out. You'll be blessed in your rising up and your lying down. Um, your, your crops and your herds will be blessed. Your children will be blessed, the fruit of your womb. Uh, all of these things were promised blessings to his church. We, we read it when we read the scripture as, as promises to Israel. But you need to remember, it were, these were promises to God's church. Because they were his church. And um, it, it was really wonderful. As you, you, We haven't time to go into all the details of that. But uh, Israel became part of the family of God. You see, the theme for this year, worldwide, as um, voted by the General Conference Committee is that we should enjoy the warmth of the fellowship of the family. That's this year's theme. Now I know about these because uh, in cooperation with another man at the General Conference, we came up with these ideas and presented them to the General Conference president and he accepted them and took them to the committee and had them voted. So, you know, I've got a background on this. I, I know, I've known for years what was coming. And and the, we're talking about the family, the fellowship of the family, not the... Not the uh, the, the earthly family, the, the you know, your, your husband, wife, children family. But we're, we're talking about the heavenly family, God's family. Warmth of fellowship in the church, God's family, which is part of the family of heaven, of course. And so uh, I want you to keep that in mind as we, as we go on through this series of, of topics. By the time of Christ, you know that the church of Israel had gone into apostasy. They rejected Christ, and so in doing that, they stepped off the platform of truth. And it became much more difficult for them to do anything like obedience to the commandments of God. You can't do that without the, the indwelling presence of Christ, you see. And so they, they stepped off the platform and went into apostasy, and God found it necessary to raise up another church on the same platform of truth as the original church was established upon. Remember Jesus saying, on this rock, referring to himself, on this Petra, this rock, I will build my church. So the New Testament church, the Christian church that Jesus established was built upon himself. Uh, obviously you have the, the correct platform again. Uh, Jesus emphasized in his teachings the importance of the Ten Commandments. You find that all through the New Testament where Jesus spoke of these things to the people. And if we took time to Read it all, Matthew chapter 15, verse 2 to 9. You have him elevating the Ten Commandments to a position of importance in the lives of his followers. So there the church then, the Christian church, was wonderfully blessed also. It was highly organized. They had <clears throat> elders and deacons and deaconesses. They took up offerings. They shared with the poor. They sent out missionaries. They had committee meetings in Jerusalem where the, the leaders of the church were. You remember... Paul had to come, Peter came and met with them there and he had to persuade them that the gospel was also for the Gentiles because they didn't feel like that, accepting that fact. And, and so you have all this organization within the church and it was identifiable. It was not a scattering of, of people that, uh, you know, you didn't know whether they were church members or not because when Paul wrote out his letters, who did he write those letters to? The church that is at Rome. The church that is at Ephesus, the church that is at Philippi, at Thessalonica, it was always to the church that is there. 
And so it was identifiable as well. And that was the Christian church that Jesus established and the apostles also in cooperation with him. And they sent out missionaries preaching the gospel in many parts of the world, Paul and Peter and all these wonderful men. But you know that even as the apostles died, apostasy was creeping in again, before they died even. Paul warned of a falling away first. He said that that day, the coming of Christ, shall not come except there come what? A falling away first. And the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Uh, and then in another place, he, uh, we read that um, uh, he says that grievous wolves would enter into the flock, not sparing the flock. Of your own selves, people would rise up that would work against the, the church and against the plans of God. And so you have again another falling away into, into apostasy. If you trace the history of the church through Bible times, you find it was a pretty seesaw ex experience, wasn't it? Up and down, up and down. And then there'd rise up a, a good king, and, and there'd come a bad king, and then a good one. And the prophets were sent to try and pull them together. It's, it's a long and interesting history. Now, we haven't time to deal with all the details here, but the apostasy that began there, uh, as the apostles died, finally led to the Dark Ages, during which time the flame of truth uh, all, uh, flickered and almost went out. You notice I said almost went out, because it didn't quite go out. God always had a faithful people. We could call them, if you like, a faithful remnant, um, you know, who, who were, was, were true to the, the uh, warp and woof of the original pattern of his church. It was always there somewhere. And it came back again, and it would disappear for it almost, come back again. And so God had his hand in this, you see. Um, Jesus had given the assurance that the gates of hell would not prevail against his church. Um, in other words, they would not wipe it right out. So let us follow along as the flame of truth is maintained. You know, you heard the other evening from uh, Dr. Paulian that, that uh, we are a people of prophecy. And you knew that, of course. I'm just underlining it again. We're a people of prophecy. And uh, the, this is where Bible prophecy becomes very useful. For just as the prophecies of Scripture help us to identify the Antichrist, the Antichrist Church, so the prophecy helps us to identify God's true Church, not only in the beginnings or in the New Testament times, but right down through into the last days of Earth's history. We're able to trace God's true Church. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12, I want to touch on this. I, I, probably won't touch on this in as much detail as I normally would because I talked with Dr. Paulian this morning. Uh, I got the impression that he is going to take us through the book of Revelation step by step. And I asked him if it was his intention to deal with Revelation chapter 12 in some detail. And I believe he plans to do that in an exegetical study, uh, helping us to appreciate the... Uh, the correctness of the historicist interpretation of Scripture. And in doing that, he is obviously going to touch over some of the, t the points that I will be touching on. And I wanted to know just to what extent, so that we wouldn't just steal each other's thunder, as it were. You know. um, but he's assured me that he's quite comfortable for me to reveal what I had in mind and we'll do that briefly. You notice in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. Now, in Bible prophecy, what does a woman represent? It represents a church. I mean, we know that. In the prophet Jeremiah uh, records a, a passage of scripture where God says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. So you have a scriptural basis for what we believe and what many commentators, Dr. Albert Barnes, the prominent uh, Presbyterian commentator, uh, says the woman beyond all question represents the church. Uh, John Wesley in his notes on Revelation 12 one says, a woman, the emblem of the church of Christ, 
The Douay Bible, the one used by the Catholics, also says this in its margins, the woman, the church of God. So we have no dispute with anybody on this issue. This is the church here, and the church is pictured as travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. Waiting for the birth of, notice verse 5, she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So here you have the woman waiting for the birth of a man-child who subsequently is caught up to God. The, the man-child that was caught up to God and his throne is Jesus Christ. There's no dispute on this point. And, and we know that. We, you're familiar with this, of course, as, as I am. Here is the church then waiting for the, as an expectant mother lives for one thing. She lives for the birth of that child. She makes preparation. She buys little clothes for it, buys a cot, bottles, all the sorts of things that are needed for the birth of the child. And so the church then is waiting here, longing, one great hope, a great longing. You know, all through Old Testament times, this was the theme of, uh, of the thoughts of the women, the mothers in Israel, that maybe their, their child, their son, would be the promised Messiah. I think that's why... Um, Abraham was willing to take and sacrifice his son Isaac. Well, it didn't come off, of course, because God intervened, but he was willing to do it. Uh, why was he willing to do it? I've got my own thoughts on that. I, I believe it's because he thought that uh, maybe this then is the Messiah. I mean, he sacrificed lambs on altars for years, and he knew what those lambs pointed forward to. Uh, this child was born of, of a miracle birth. His mother was, uh, the mother was too old to have a child. And so you have all the, the likenesses. If we took time, you could see the parallels between the birth of Isaac and the birth of Jesus and, and Abraham's attitude toward that child uh, as, uh, as it might be the Messiah. And, of course, the Scripture says that he counted that God was able to raise him again from the dead. So you have many parallels there. And, and, and this is just to illustrate, as I was saying, that the people of the mothers of Israel... Uh, looked forward with keen anticipation to the birth of their ch children ho in the hopes that maybe their son would be the promised Messiah. And so this prophecy had real meaning for the people of, of John's day uh, because uh, it is the story of the birth of Christ, something which they had looked forward to with, with very keen anticipation through the years. But the church was not the only one waiting for the birth of Jesus. You notice in verse 3, it says, There appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And verse 5, it says, uh, verse, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, where are we? Verse uh, 4. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, who is the dragon? Notice verse 9. The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So here you have then the, the devil, Satan, waiting for the birth of Christ. Now why would the devil be waiting for the birth of Christ so as to devour him? Why would he want to do that? I believe it was to even up an old score he had. You see, he, there'd been war in heaven and the devil had been cast out. You have that dropped in there. You notice in, in verses um, uh, 7 and, to 9, it says there was war in heaven. John drops this in so you understand why the devil was waiting. There had been war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven, and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now he had this score to, to even up, see. And he thought, I'll get this fellow, I'll get this man, this Messiah, the Christ, I'll get him when he's born. And you know what happened, of course. The devil, through Herod, made an attempt to have him killed, ready to devour him, see? An attempt to have him killed. And when he missed out on that, he whipped up the hatred of the people and he had him crucified. But in this very thing, of course, he sounded his own death knell. Christ's final victory over sin was assured and salvation was thereby guaranteed to all who believe. That's portrayed in verse 10. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. I believe that's when Satan was shut out of heaven once and for all. You know, he, was, he went back into heaven after he was cast out originally. 
You read Job chapter 1, what does it say? The sons of, of God came together. Those were the Adams of the various created worlds. Came together for a council with God. And who went from this world since our Adam couldn't? Satan went. He said, I represent the earth. I mean, the, the Adam you created is dead and gone. And so I represent the earth. It's my domain. And here he was. God said, what are you doing here? He said, well, I, I come from the earth. And God said, you don't represent everybody down there. What about my servant Job? He's a righteous man. You don't represent him. Mm -hmm. So you see, there was the, this was the whole thing. And Satan was going back and forth to heaven whenever he had a chance back to accuse the brethren before God. But at this point, he was cast out. The accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. Shut out from heaven forever at that point. Wonderful triumph of victory, wasn't it? The victory of Christ over evil. Now, um, because he knows or knew that his days were numbered, the devil became very angry. And you read in verse 12 a description of that. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. And... Uh, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth he hath but a short time. Uh, you can expect the devil's hatred to increase in his attempts to blind our eyes to truth, to become more and more intense and more deceptive, more difficult to discern as time goes by, as we come nearer and nearer to the end of time. Now, I want you to notice verse 13. It says, When the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth, what did he do? He persecuted the woman, you see. He missed out on the child, so now he turns his fury on the, 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 the mother, the, the child's mother. And this prophecy, the mother, the woman, was what? The church. So here you have the devil now turning his fury against the church. And it's a long history, true to Bible prophecy, the early church endured terrible persecution, first from the Jews and then from the Roman emperors. You have men like Nero and Diocletian right through the 4th century AD. Millions died. People were, were killed in boiling oil. They were, they were burned at the stake. They were thrown to wild beasts. They were killed in duels and all kinds of, of ways, cruel ways in which the church members were, were persecuted. Revelation 12, 11 says they loved not their lives unto death, which implies that many of them died. You know, we use that word illusion that uh, Dr. Paulian did the other night. Uh, this is an illusion to Daniel because all through the book of Revelation you have these illusions to Daniel. Just a little word picture takes you back to Daniel and, and the idea is that you, you should uh, enlarge your mind, your understanding of the, the topic by... Uh, reflecting on what Daniel has to say on the topic, on the subject. And here, uh, he, it's an allusion back to the, the uh, text or the, the expression in the book of Daniel where it says that the fourth beast will wear out the saints of the Most High. Wear them out. And if you wear them out, you wear them right down. Yeah. Uh, it was John's intention in this prophecy that, that we should take into, into account in understanding all of this the prophecies of the book of Daniel. Now, you know that the church prospered under persecution. Sure, many people died, but uh, you couldn't kill the message. It just kept on going and going. People, you know, it, people's interest was awakened in truth because of what the followers of God's truth were going through. That's the way it works. And uh, the church prospered. And so the devil changed his tactics. Um, Daniel 8, verse 25 says that uh, he would buy peace destroy many. Now, it doesn't sound like persecution anymore, does it? By peace he would destroy many. Uh, what, is it, what do you think that means? Have you thought about that? What do you think that means? Yeah, counterfeit religion. The devil would get inside the church and, and distort the teachings of God's word within the church. See? With peaceful words, flowery doctrine, wonderful sounding stuff, but leading people astray from the, the path of truth, so cunningly, you see, that people might not detect it. 
As we heard in the service, was it yesterday? Things will not always be this, what they appear to be. <laughs> you see, things might look good, but I'm going to speak on that topic myself uh, in one of the morning studies when I speak on the Christian Coalition, the United States Christian Coalition, and the tremendous events that are building up to fulfill the prophecies of Revelation chapter 13. You've got to hear that subject if it's, if it's the only Bible study you come to after this. Um, Things are not always what they appear to be. All right, well now, here the church then, the devil rather, changed his tactics and decided instead of attacking from the outside of the church, he would destroy the church from the inside. And so early in the 4th century, the Emperor Constantine professed conversion, brought a lot of paganism into the Christian church. Um, the church fell to, into apostasy during this time. Uh, there was a small group that remained faithful to the doctrines of the church, and uh, these early faithful people were the descendants of the woman in white, spiritually, the woman of Revelation 12.1. Uh, soon these small groups were persecuted by the popular church of the day. In 538, Justinian uh, decreed that all in the empire must join the prevailing church of the day. I'm not going to name it, you know it. Going to, going, going to, uh, that they must join the prevailing church of the day or have their goods confiscated and leave the empire, be banished from the empire. Now many succumbed, of course, but many remained faithful and, and that's what happened. The church never compromised. They chose to leave the empire and all who remained true to Christ withdrew to the mountain regions, the caves for protection. This flight was foretold right here in this chapter. Notice Revelation 12, verse 6. And the woman fled where? Into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And in verse 14, you have the same thought. To the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she's nourished for how long? A time? and times, and the dividing of time. So here again you have another allusion back to Daniel, because in, in the book of Daniel you have this time period spoken of exactly in Daniel 7 verse 25, a time and times and the dividing of time, it says in Daniel. And John picks up the same terminology. It says a time and times and half a time. The woman's going to be hiding away, and you know what that means, don't you? Three and a half years, 1260 days in the Jewish years, and, and that was the 1260 years from 538 to 1798, during which time you have the Dark Ages, during which time the, the popular church of the day persecuted those who were faithful to God's truth, and they had to flee and hide. And uh, there were many scholars who were convinced that God deliberately designed the mountains of France and uh, northern Italy uh, for as uh, places where his faithful people could, could hide safely from the persecuting forces of um, the church of the day, the main church of the day. Um, in, in these mountain regions, God marvelously protected his church, one notable case being that of the Waldensis, northern Italy. I had the privilege of uh, visiting the Italian Alps a number of years ago. I've been there twice. Places like Arno and Torre Pellice and the cave church where the faithful worshipped in one of those areas, worshipped in a cave church for many, many long years. You know, it was like a, a pilgrimage for me. A pilgrimage back to search out the heritage of my church. And I have to tell you, I felt honoured as I, I sat there on a rock and, and washed my feet in the, the cool waters of the streams that tumbled down the mountainsides there, streams that ran red with the blood of martyrs. I felt honoured to have that privilege. That was the part of my heritage as a church, a member of this church, the family of God. And wonderful stories could be told of what happened during those, those years. Now, of course, uh, it's a long and thrilling story, but the point is that God's faithful people, his church, were not on centre stage during those long years, 1260 years, 538 to 1798. They were not on centre stage. If you went out in search of the church, you probably wouldn't have found them. You'd have found the popular church of the day, but, but the, the church of God was in hiding in the wilderness places. The word wilderness meaning uninhabited areas. 
What of her future? Do we lose track of the church, the woman in the wilderness during these years? Well, of course not. I mean, this is God's church. So let's notice now in Revelation 12 and verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. What is a remnant? The last part. Yeah, last part that's the same as the first part. Okay. It's the same in colour, shape, all that. It's the same. It has the same characteristics as the first part because there's a remnant of it. And so here you have the remnant. The last church is not to be another. It's the last one. It's the very last church in the last days. And notice that it's back on the same platform of truth. The remnant which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's the platform on which the original church was established, you see. And so you've been following now the, the history, the heritage of God's church down through the years, and it's back again restored. Peter tells us that just before Jesus comes, there was to be a restitution and that there will become a refreshing from the presence of the Lord. Now, a refreshing, of course, is the outpouring of the Spirit of God that would restore truth. John, uh, uh, John chapter 16 says, When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will do what? He will guide you into all truth. So you see, when you get a refreshing from the presence of the Lord and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that is going to restore all truth. It's going to bring you a knowledge of truth. The truths that have been lost, as it were, or hidden away for centuries because of the persecuting powers of the evil one, these truths would be brought back again. And when God was ready, he raised up people like Martin Luther, who restored back to the church some of the truths of God's word. The just shall live by faith was his main theme. And you have others, John Wesley, the Wesley brothers, they introduced holiness of living. The, the Baptists introduced baptism by immersion. And there were many other names of the great reformers, Huss and Jerome and Calvin and Zwingli and Knox. Uh, and there were, new, there were churches, the Church of England and the Church of Scotland, the Presbyterians. Uh, there was uh, the, the Church of, of Holland, the, the Reformed Church. There, were, there was the Church of, uh, uh, of Luther, the Lutheran Church, and, and others. Churches, various churches raised up. But God was still working, and the Reformation was not quite finished yet. And so in North America, at the right time, after 1798, note, after 1798, after the 1260 years of hiding, there was a great Second Advent movement uh, initiated by the opening of the prophecies of the book of Daniel. We heard last night how those prophecies were closed up. God said, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end, for then knowledge will be increased and men shall run to and fro in Scripture, studying Scripture and understanding it, you see. And so at the right time, the little book of Daniel was opened, put in the hands of, of John in that vision we heard about last night, you see. And it was the study of, of the little book of Daniel that tasted sweet in the mouths uh, of, of the people. For oh, I'm sorry, yeah, John, in the mouth of John. John stood in for the people who would open the book after 1798. John was, the, was acting the part of the church who would have the privilege of opening the prophecies of the book of Daniel after 1798. And so as, as a, a result of the study of the, of the book of Daniel... A tremendous interest arose in the second coming of, of Jesus. Time shall be no longer, so Christ is coming soon. And they got the impression that Jesus was coming at the end of the 2,300-day prophecy. The most significant date was October 22 and 1844. And the effect of the great disappointment was that many gave up their interest in biblical studies because when Christ did not come, they thought the Bible had been wrong or they'd misunderstood or something, and they, many gave up their study of prophecy. However, God was carefully shepherding his faithful people, and through a more careful study and much prayer, the light of truth was to shine more brightly. I think of Spaulding's uh, statement as uh, recorded in one of our publications, The Origin and History of Seventh Adventist, Volume 1, page 23. The Miller Movement was the immediate background of the Seventh-day Adventist people and church and the matrix in which they were formed. Although its, its developed theology, oh, I'm sorry, although in its developed theology, this church has made advances beyond Miller's initial doctrines and taught the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ without Miller's time-setting, 
the moral awakening and the keen anticipation of the Advent in, in the 1844 movement are the womb from which was born the modern child, the church. So, you see, there's a lot of history in there. There are whole books that have been written on this, volumes written on the, 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 the uh, great Second Advent movement of the 1840s or 1800s. But let me pause for a moment because you, you may, may or may not know that there were several disappointments. October 22, 1844 was not the only one. There were earlier disappointments. The first date that was set was for 1843. Um, they did their calculations and came up with that year. And then when Jesus didn't come in 1843, they set March 21, 1844. And when he didn't come then, they set April 18, 1844. And when Jesus didn't come uh, on that occasion, um, the, the Protestant churches in which many of these people belonged, the, the, the churches of the day, um, decided that it was time to do something about it. And so they used the disappointment of these people as a fulcrum. And the pastors offered them the alternative of recanting their faith or of being levered overboard, out of the church, thrown out of membership. Now, many gave in at that time. They'd been through several disappointments, and they thought, well, this is, we've had enough. And many gave up their, they recanted their faith in the soon coming of Jesus, but uh, there were others who clung to their hope and were set adrift by their churches. And the leaders of the early Advent movement, under these circumstances, reluctantly came to the conclusion that there was no fellowship for their people in the popular churches of the day that were opposed to their faith. And so they, they gave the cry, Come out of her, my people. You know, they found those words in Scripture. And so they decided to use this. They felt that this was the time for it. Come out of her, my people. And most of the Adventist believers, uh, well, Advent believers, uh, thus became separated from their former churches and um, began to worship independently of the churches of the day. Now, at this point, I want to introduce a man called Snow. Under these conditions, the teachings of Snow that the antitypical or heavenly day of atonement was to come on the Jewish day of atonement, the Yom Kippur of the Jewish calendar, uh, and that this fell on October 22, 1844, October 22 now, you know, not March, not April, but October 22, that, that uh, this aroused a new and greater fervor. And they also applied Jesus' parable of the ten virgins and claimed that the delay in the coming of Jesus was foretold in that parable, you see, where the virgins waited, you know, and some of them, their, their lamps went out because they didn't have enough oil. There was a waiting time, see. And so they said, well, this waiting period is part of the experience of the church just before the coming of Christ. And it says it was foretold in the words, while the bridegroom tarried. And this became known as the seventh month movement and soon gained a greater momentum than ever. He will come, was the way people greeted you. You know, today uh, on the Sabbath, uh, for example, you, you meet somebody, what do you say? Happy Sabbath. <laughs> you know, uh, it's a, a very common greeting in our church today. Happy Sabbath. Well, the greeting that, that became very popular back there, leading up to October 22, was, He will come. And the reply? He will not tarry the second time. See? So I would say, He will come. And you would say, He will not tarry the second time. See? And, and they, they encouraged one another with this hope, and they built up a tremendous uh, crescendo of excitement for October 22, 1844. And when that day came, you know, you've heard the story, haven't you, how many of them went out waiting. I had the privilege, uh, been several times now, to the rock uh, near uh, William Miller's home. He didn't go out onto the rock. William Miller stayed in the church all that day, praying and expecting Christ to come, but uh, his followers went out there onto the rock and they waited and looked skyward all day, waiting. Any moment now we're going to see Christ coming back, and he didn't come. He didn't come. You know, another disappointment. This, this time more bitter than ever. Terribly bitter disappointment. Can you imagine it? They had expected the end of the reign of sin. No more suffering, no more sadness, no more temptation, all of that. 
passed. It was gone. They hadn't reaped reap their crops this year. They hadn't even sown their crops in many instances. And they'd, they'd uh, neglected the, the work of their farms and their properties. And their neighbors had laughed them to scorn, and it was worse now. Terrible disappointment. Jesus had not come. Well, they were crushed, as I've been saying, and uh, they just wondered what uh, possibly could be the reason for this. Their enemies scoffed. Many gave up their faith. In the, in the farmhouse of a man called Hiram Edson, just outside of Port Gibson in New York, a small group of believers had waited, and there was weeping here as they questioned one another. Had the scriptures failed? Was there no reward of the saints? Was the Bible false? And Hiram Edson, the man who owned the farm, spoke up and he said, Not so, brethren. There is a God in heaven. He will not fail us now. Sometime soon, this mystery will be solved. You know, I, I'm uh, aware of uh, William Miller's reaction to it all. William Miller himself was bitterly disappointed also. But William Miller said, I have set another time for the second coming of Jesus. After October 22. Okay? I've set another time for the coming of Christ. Today, 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 until he comes. Now that was a good way to approach it, wasn't it? He was still confident that Jesus was coming and that he was coming soon. And uh, he remained faithful to that belief right through to his death. He will come, yeah. Miller wrote, there is a forsaking of the world and an unconcern for the wants of life, a general searching of heart, a confession of sin, and a deep feeling in prayer for Christ to come. Well, after Hiram Edson gave this encouraging statement to the, to the people that were gathered in his home, uh, one by one, the believers slipped away to their now desolate homes. And to the few who remained, Hiram Edson said, let's go out into the barn and let's pray. And so they did. They went out into the barn and they prayed there. They poured out their souls in anguish supplication to God that he would reveal to them just what it was that had happened. How, how, how have we gone wrong in this thing? Please do not desert us in this hour of trial. And they prayed until they felt the assurance that God would answer their prayer, that the Spirit would come and that their disappointment would be explained. They got a strong feeling of assurance that came over them at that time. After breakfast, Edson said, let us go out now and comfort the brethren with this assurance. Now, he was a leader, wasn't he, in time of crisis in the church, a real leader. Let's go out and, and comfort the brethren with this assurance. And so they set out across a field, a cornfield. Perhaps it was because it was a shortcut to the homes of some of their believing neighbors, or maybe it was to avoid their mocking enemies. <laughs> but they went across a field so instead of the road. And halfway across the field, Edson stopped, as if a hand had been placed on his shoulder. And uh, when asked what he had stopped for, he answered that the Lord was answering their morning prayer. God had enlightened his mind with a clear understanding of the message of the heavenly sanctuary and that 1844 was the beginning of the heavenly judgment. You know, the two who were enlightened as they walked through the cornfield were like the two who walked on the road to Emmaus after Jesus' crucifixion. Do you remember? And when Jesus walked with them, he finally enlightened their minds, it says, in, in, in turning to the, the, uh, the scriptures, he revealed unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so their minds were enlightened to the truth at their time of disappointment. And so it was with these two who walked across the, the field. In both cases, their sadness was turned to joy as they comprehended the truth. Let me tell you this, that just as I believe God allowed the disappointment in the times of the, the disciples, the apostles, when they cried out, the kingdom, Lord, the kingdom, wilt thou at this time restore unto us the kingdom? And instead of that, he gave them a job of work to do and went back to heaven and left them. What a terrible disappointment that was. They'd expected the end of the reign of sin, the kingdom, Lord. But I believe God allowed that disappointment for this reason. He was about to raise up a movement in the early Christian church that was to take the gospel to all the world. To every nation, kindred, tongue, you know, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. They weren't ready to take it yet. They didn't understand the, the truths fully yet. 
And so God allowed the disappointment because as a result of that disappointment, they were driven to deeper study of, of the prophecies of God's word and the scriptures. And only as a result of deeper study and the infilling of the spirit of God were they prepared to go out as missionaries to the world. See? And the same thing in 1844, God was about to raise up his remnant church, a movement that was to take this message to every nation, kindred, tongue and people, and he needed a people who understood the scriptures correctly, who could restore to this world all the truths that had been shadowed and hidden and, and had uh, be, disappeared down through the years. And so he allowed the disappointment of 1844. It was like a, 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 a fulcrum, if you like. It, it, it drove the people who came through the disappointment, it drove them to deeper study of the Word. And they searched the Scriptures in prayer and, 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 and uh, repentance of sin until they were rewarded by the infilling of the Spirit that brought to them an understanding of truth. And that when, when they had the understanding of truth, then God saw fit to, to put together this church. You know, it was through Rachel Preston and Joseph Bates that the Sabbath truth was restored to the Advent believers. You remember the platform of truth we've been talking about? You know, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You've got it all there, all back again. And this was the heritage of God's special people, his church. Now, the story of Ellen White and her husband James White fills out the picture. It's another story. We haven't time for it today. But let me simply add that God was pleased to give his latter-day church the gift of prophecy through the, the work of Ellen G. White. It was at a session of delegates who met at Battle Creek, commencing on September 30, 1860, that a vote was taken to register the group of believers as the Seventh-day Adventist church. Thus began God's last-day church, based on the same platform as the church in the wilderness, and the Christian church of the New Testament times, the church commissioned and destined to carry the banner of truth to the gates of heaven. I am grateful that I have found the heritage of this family, the family of God. Aren't you? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Now, loving Father, we, we are so grateful. We rejoice and thank you for leading us to a knowledge of this wonderful truth, that through the years you have had a special interest in the affairs of men, and that you have had a people here, part of the heavenly family, that represent you here on earth. Help us to appreciate the importance of the privilege that we share, and help us to represent your family correctly, in a loving way to the people around us, that they too may be drawn into your family, is my prayer in Jesus' name.